So uh, I've been trying to make this video for, uh, well, look, I'm very frustrated at the moment. I've been trying to make a video for a few hours now. I've made actually a few cuts of it. And when I got down to editing, I just really didn't like it. Uh, I'm trying to make a video uh, explaining exactly why Ireland or and Dublin have a housing crisis at the moment. But I, one, I just tried to sit down behind a desk and I recorded it away, but I just basically felt when I was editing it, it was basically a very boring, long-winded economics lecture. And I really didn't want to put that out on YouTube, so scrap that. I've tried this again and I'm trying to do it in a different way, but then I realized and I did it a different way. My editing skills in terms of putting graphs together on within a video just aren't that great. So I have decided to try again. This is my third or fourth time. So please bear with me. I don't think this video would be great, but there is good information within the video. So please watch for the information. Uh, graphics and stuff and editing probably won't be the best, but I'll try, I'll try edit this together. Um, for those of you who don't know, my name is Shane Fleming. Welcome to my channel. As I said in this video, I am going to be discussing uh, why Ireland are facing a housing issue at the moment. If you are interested in property uh, or any other related topics make sure you give this video a thumbs up and also uh, hit that subscribe button so as i said in this video i'm going to be talking about the housing crisis uh, we do see lots of reports in ireland at the moment uh, from giving out about the help to buy scheme uh, in terms of affecting supply also a lot of criticism of the shared equity scheme that has been proposed that may not get per may not actually get approval at this stage also, there's a lot of uh, kind of now reports in regards to tax and vacant properties. Uh, there is a lot of negativity in the press in regards to developers, REITs and pension funds. And there's more uh, articles in the press in regards to uh, TDs who are actually um, opposing housing developments, which they've done all along. But I think it's quite good that now actually there is some press highlighting the TDs that, that are and the local councillors that are actually opposing housing developments when in a time when we actually need a lot of houses to be built. So what I'm going to do in this video, I'm not going to harp on about that uh, those topics anymore. What I'm really going to do is try focus a little bit on the economics behind it. Um, try break it down as simply as I possibly can. And I will run through a few graphs. I think the easiest way is if I just pop them up here and explain a few things. But I think the first thing is when we're talking about, the first thing is demand. So when we talk about demand for cities, we have to think about who is willing to live there and what price they are willing to pay to live within a city or an urban area or anywhere else. I think for this video, maybe use Dublin for an example in most, occasion, most um, incidents, just purely on the basis that lack of imagination from my point. But when you think of someone living in the city, they get really two benefits. The first benefit they get is an income benefit. Uh, that's pretty simple. Working in the city, they get paid a salary if they're working or if they're creating employment. They get uh, an income. The second benefit is a non-income benefit, which generally is described as amenities. Those amenities can be positive or negative. Uh, in terms of if in an urban area, you could be talking about overcrowding, traffic congestion, pollution, uh, but the positives could be uh, access, easier access to healthcare, easier access to education, also uh, good restaurants, bars, um, nightclubs, etc., dating, entertainment, all the things that come in terms of the benefits of living in an, a built up urban area. And Basically, they're the two benefits you get from living in a city or any other location. And what determines the kind of the value someone might place on living in a particular area has to be compared to an alternative. So in Dublin's case, that alternative might be the likes of Cork, it might be uh, Galway, or might be even living in the countryside or even London. So someone will weigh up the benefits in terms of what salary they might get uh, and also the pros and cons of living within that city in terms of the amenities they may benefit from. They compare all of those things together and they come up with a value in terms of how much they are willing to uh, live in a city at a certain price. So that's where we get into the demand side of things. I'll flick over here now to this spreadsheet or this presentation. So what we have here on a simple economics uh, supply and demand graph for, on the 
horizontal axis, we will have price. So all along here we have price and then quantity. So the higher the price uh, is on this side, and then the, so this is kind of starting at zero in terms of quantity, and in quantity what we mean in this instance is effectively we're talking about units, or we're talking about unit uh, or number of population, and in terms of price we're talking about price to live within the city in terms of actually renting or uh, buying in the city. We then kind of break it up into individuals. So at first off, you might have someone who's willing to pay. There might only be one person there. There might be willing to pay a million. Then the next person might be willing to pay 900,000. Next person, 500, 400, 300. And then as we get lower down in terms, there's gonna be far more people who are willing to spend like 100,000 or 10,000 to live in a particular area. But we build that all up and we're talking about um, tens of millions of people who might have the potential to live in a certain area. And what we get is when we smush all these together, we get a kind of continuous line and that gives us our demand line. And that is what we use or what we refer to as our demand line in economics. The higher the price, there's going to be less people willing to uh, pay a million up here but there's gonna be a vast majority of people who are willing to pay 10 grand or whatever, 100 grand down here to live in a city. But the demand curve can actually shoot outwards in terms of if a city. So basically, what I mean by this in terms of it shifting out. So if a city becomes more desirable, the demand curve will shift out. That means that if uh, income is easier to get, i.e. Uh, employers are paying more, or perhaps the city has improved, crime has dropped, uh, there's more uh, restaurants and bars in the city, or perhaps there is uh, the government or council have been doing a really good job managing and maintaining the city and pe more people want to live there. But also, demand for a city centre or an urban area or any location actually can drop as well. And in terms of that dropping, what I mean by perhaps it could drop because unemployment is high and there's less wages to be paid or it could drop because uh, crime rates have risen and therefore so, so the demand curve can move up and down and that will determine the price that people are willing to pay and also the quantity of the amount of people who are willing to live in a particular area and you can see that, that this is what I mean by that the original um, number of people might say, just for our sake of argument, could have been about 500,000 if the city becomes better and more people want to live there, demand goes up and we might get to 600,000 or vice versa, if the city disimproves, we might actually get to 400,000 in terms of the amount of people who want to be there. This, this is normally the place where you'd actually put a supply uh, curve in there which will look something like that but we will get into that in a little bit more detail in terms of what that actually means but for now we'll just explain the supply curve so in terms of supply when we're talking about supply within cities we're talking about uh, the availability of units we're not just talking about what's on the market at any particular day what we're talking about is the overall city in terms of the number of units that are available within that city so let's for sake for argument take dublin and let's we'll cap dublin out at a million units and that's a million sites that possible units can be built on uh, for an economics point of view we have to assume that they're all the same they all, everyone shares the same commute, there's no major difference between them. The only major difference between them is the cost of actually completing and finishing out a finished unit. So in terms of supply, the supply curve will always uh, start at the bottom and move upwards. It means that there's only a few uh, sites, in terms of what we're talking about here, a few sites can be developed at a certain price here, let's say 100 grand, but as we move up the price list, more and more sites can actually be developed meaning that more quantity can be developed as well. Uh, the price uh, in this relates to the bill costs. So as you move out on the curve, there's more sites available to actually be developed. And when we're talking about sites, we're not just talking about uh, one individual lot. We're also talking about kind of units on top of units. So when you think about this in terms of your million units, uh, it's not just a flat city where there's one unit on t uh, for every lot. We're also talking about, there, it could be mixed, there could be one unit on this very cheap lot, 
that only costs uh, 100,000 to develop because it's a greenfield site. And then there could be another unit on a brownfield site that was, you'll have to knock down an industrial unit to um, build your unit on, and that's more expensive. Demand or supply curve can actually shift upwards for a number of different reasons if prices get more expensive. So it can mean that um, increased taxes, increased uh, construction costs can shift the supply curve upwards. And it can also shift it downwards if uh, costs for construction uh, or costs on tax are reduced, it can shift it downwards. But let's just move on to where supply and demand intersect. So this is called your market equilibrium. And let's just assume for argument's sake that in our, this example, we're talking about Dublin, the market equilibrium is 500,000 people living within the city. And we'll just let's assume that the price of the average house at the, this point is 400,000. Um, that's where we are, Just let's just say that's where we are at the moment. However, what can happen in this kind of example in terms of what's happening is demand can shift up uh, for a number of different reasons. Perhaps more people want to live in a particular area because amenities have, have improved or perhaps uh, people, less people want to live in a certain area because crime has increased. So let's just have that quick example of what can happen in reality. So let's just say um, demand has gone up uh, in a certain area. What happens in a normal standard economic model of supply and demand is if uh, demand goes up, supply or uh, the quantity that's in the market will actually increase as well in terms of supply and the price will go up to match that. However, we know that that's not what's happening in reality and this is not a perfect um, solution, but it's just a kind of an idea, it gives you an idea of what actually happens from an economic point of view. I will go into more detail on what's actually happening from a Dublin point of view. So in terms of trying to explain what's happening in Dublin, I think it's important to try explain what's happening in other cities as well. But let's take Houston uh, for in Texas as an example, because I think it's kind of the exact opposite of what's happening to Dublin. So in Houston, in Texas, there is a huge amount of sites available. They're all pretty much the same. So therefore, and there's very little planning restrictions. So therefore, it is easy to add more units or more um, uh, complexes and more apartments and houses to the city without actually impacting on the price all that much. In terms of Dublin, Dublin is a constrained city from a historical point of view, from a planning point of view, and from a building cost point of view. So the more we try to actually deliver, uh, the, uh, the harder it is to deliver more uh, quality sites or cheaper sites, and it means that price goes up quite quickly. So what actually happens when you add in a demand curve to this? So let's assume that uh, this is a demand curve that has been added. We have, uh, we're indicating here that this is where Houston and uh, Houston's demand supply and curve uh, meets. Let's just say they have a million people here within the city. And let's just assume this is where Dublin meets and we have about 500 in the city. Let's just say demand increases. So demand increases in Houston and in Dublin. Let's just see what happens in Houston first. So in Houston, let's say we were at a million, the population goes up quite considerably. Let's say it's gone up 250,000 and we're now at 1.25 million. You can see there's a big gap there in terms of uh, the amount of people who have moved to the city. However, the actual price uh, for the houses has, has, hasn't shifted too much. Even though demand has increased massively, uh, there's been a huge increase in demand, but because Houston can deliver homes quickly and fast and affordable, the actual uh, price hasn't increased all that much. However, look what happens in terms of Dublin scenario. So we were say here, at, say 500,000 500, uh, or in terms of population, uh, let's say demand has increased for a certain area within Dublin. What happens is demand has increased and the price has gone up dramatically. So while we are not actually, um, we're not actually delivering the same amount of houses. So we might have gone from 500,000, just a small amount to 550,000 because, and 
we've had a huge price increase in that. So that's realistically what is happening in the Dublin market at the moment in terms of the fact that because there is such constraints on delivering new supply, we have an impact, it's impacting the affordability within the city. Biggest issues we have is the planning policies that we have within Ireland and it's impacting everywhere in terms of the supply of housing. In 2017, the government kind of came out with a new uh, Strategic Housing Development Act, which was meant to fast track uh, property developments or housing developments that were over um, 100 units. However, while it has helped a little bit and is de def definitely delivering more houses in terms of the planning process, it still is a very, very slow process. So a number of the government schemes that have come out in the last few years have been, I suppose, technically aimed at the supply side in terms of trying to improve sli uh, uh, supply from the help to buy scheme and in terms of the new scheme that has been proposed for the shared equity scheme, which may not get approval. But they have technically been aimed at supply because they've been aimed solely at new homes in terms of trying to generate new homes or new construction. That said, even though they are technically aimed at the supply side, because uh, Dublin has this shape of a, of a, of a uh, supply curve, what is actually happening is because the curve is like that, uh, demand, any, any small increase in demand is having a much bigger impact on the overall market in terms of affordability than the supply side incentives that are there. So technically, while they're classed as supply side uh, schemes, realistically, they're having a bigger impact in terms of driving demand. And when they drive demand, they are actually improving the income we talked about at the very start. Uh, they're improving the income of potential first-time buyers in terms of how they can save for a deposit quickly. And that is ultimately having a bigger impact on the demand curve than it is on the supply curve. Realistically, what we need is something to help bring that um, supply curve down in terms of costs. So more houses become uh, affordable and more quality houses and quantity of houses can be built uh, because the supply curve has been brought down. Realistically, the only way to do that is providing incentives for um, on the cost side. So helping to reduce costs in terms of build costs, removing some of the VAT, and also uh, trying to look at design regs that make it cheaper and easier to build uh, across the country. So I know that has been a very long-winded presentation. I hope this one comes out better than the last uh, one or two that I've done. If you've stuck with me all the way through this, fair, absolute fair play to you. Thank you very much for watching all the way through. I would like if you give the video a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. And if you found this in any way useful, please go ahead and share it on other social media channels. And as always, thanks for watching.